was that apartheid simply could not work. The reason being that the areas set aside for the indigenous African population and the areas set aside for the white population were so closely connected in every meaningful sense, historically, economically, socially, demographically, that you can never in any meaningful sense separate out the reality of the Bantu stance from South Africa. Simply put, as some of you no doubt know, South Africa was totally dependent on Bantustan labor, and the Bantustans were totally dependent on work in South Africa, and as I mentioned earlier, the financial grants of the South African government. Simply put, that means that the Bantustan arrangement, or apartheid generally, was a fiction. You could never, in reality, unscramble the whites and the blacks in South Africa. And the fact of the matter is, in my view, the same basic reality obtains in Israel-Palestine. So to quote Ben Denisi again, I'm quoting him because he is the former vice mayor of Jerusalem and the recognized authority in the West Bank and Gaza, and also remarkably honest in certain respects. He writes, referring to the Oslo Accord, he says, the Accord provide for the establishment of a permanent committee to supervise cooperation in a long list of areas, such as water, electricity and energy, finance and international investment, banking, the port of Gaza, communication, transport, labor relations, and so on. The long list of areas in which cooperation and coordination is essential points to one basic fact that the advocates of separation have yet to grasp. The country, from the Jordan to the sea, can perhaps be divided politically, but not physically. And I think that's accurate. There is no longer, if there was ever a possibility for a two-state settlement, it no longer exists. The area from the Mediterranean to the Jordan is now a single integral entity. There is no way to unscramble Israel from Palestine. There are possibilities. You can exterminate the Palestinian population. I think that's a doubtful prospect. You can expel the Palestinians. It's a possible but an unlikely prospect because Palestinians com compose roughly half the population between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. It's about 3 million, 4 million now, if you include the Israeli-Palestinian population, which I do. And the third possibility is such a massive Jewish immigration that it renders the Palestinian population trivial by comparison. That's what the American solution to the indigenous prob pro problem consisted of. I don't think that's a possibility either. Barring extermination, expulsion, and massive Jewish immigration, what you have left is an integral entity between the West Bank, excuse me, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. It's a pipe dream to imagine that you can unscramble them. It's a fiction. And here I want to just conclude with Edward Said's la words in his last chapter. Throughout the book, Professor Said clings, his book being Peace and its Discontents, he clings to the idea of a two-state settlement. But you can see that reality has sunk in for him as well, uh, as, it is, as it will for anybody who's journeyed there. Uh, I was there uh, most recently during the Palestinian so-called elections, and the settlements are no, they're no longer settlements. We have to be honest about that. They are full and integral communities uh, in the West Bank. Said, as I said, in his last chapter, he writes, Palestine-Israel is the place where two peoples 
whether they like it or not, live inextricably linked lives tied together by history, war, daily contact, and suffering. To speak in grandiose geopolitical terms or to speak mindlessly about separating them is nothing less than to provide prescriptions for more violence and degradation. There is simply no substitute for seeing these two communities as equal to each other in rights and expectations, and then proceeding from there to do justice to their living actualities. As Saeed's parting words suggest, the inevitable, if very, very distant future, is one in which Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews enjoying reciprocal, communal, and individual rights coexist within a unitary entity. Consigned to a footnote, Oslo will no doubt be dismissed one day as a sordid detour, a really shameful detour, on the path to that just and lasting peace. Thank you. Before I open the floor to questions and answers, the acoustics in this room are very poor. So I'm going to ask anyone who has a question to please rise from their seat and speak as loudly and as clearly as possible. I'll allow approximately two minutes per question and a supplemental, and then I'll have to move on. So uh, that's the basic format. The floor, the floor is officially open, and I'll try and recognize the hands as I see them. First question. My, my question is, uh, you, you mean to discuss the unfairness and excessiveness of the Israeli state. Uh, would you mind shedding some light on the role of another frontline uh, player who, who plays as a jury judge advocate and judge at the same time in the United States? What what it gets from from what where his interest lies, what it gets from the destruction of Palestine? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question basically uh, I think to put simply is what accounts for the United States' uh, inflexible support for Israeli actions in the Middle East? How do you account for it? That's obviously a very complicated question for which there are uh, no obvious or simple answers. Arguments generally relate, range between two camps those who argue that it's the decisive influence of the Jewish community in the United States that compels the U.S. government to act in ways which is contrary to its interests. That's one view. And a second view has it that Israel serves useful policing functions in the Middle East for the United States. And in exchange for the useful policing functions that Israel serves, there's a kind of quid pro quo. That is, Israel will do the U.S.'s bidding, but Israel asks something in return, and the return it asks for is, is, is a free hand in the conquest of Palestine. My own, my own predisposition is to support the second view, but I don't think it's a case that can be easily proved. I think there are arguments on both sides, uh, but there's no question, in my mind at least, that Israel performs an important policing function, and that probably in the future, contrary to all of the uh, claims, it's, it's, uh, its um, status as a, uh, a local police force will be uh, enhanced uh, there. Israel does for the United States what the PLO is now doing for Israel. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, Can you stand up and speak loud? I have a comment, actually. It's not a question. Uh, I read this article saying that Israel couldn't catch this fast and smart boy, with that, which is Hamas, and so they got this little dog, which is PLO and Arafat, for free to do it for them. For them. 
And the other point which I want to make is that you said all Palestinians, they consider this as compromise. Actually, those who are, you know, they know themselves by Palestinians, they consider it as compromise. But Muslims, they don't consider it as compromise because uh, you can see that it's a steal. It's not a, it's not a compromise. Well, actually, I don't believe that any Palestinians regard it as a compromise. I said the unfortunate, the unfortunate thing is the way the international community is reacting to all that's unfolding, and unfortunately, the PLO's acceptance of the Oslo Accords played a crucial role in legitimizing the international community's abandonment of what had been a quite substantial commitment over some 25 years to a reasonable and just resolution of the conflict. Had the PLO not given its stamp of approval, I think it's unlikely that the international community could have so completely abandoned the, uh, the position that it had held for some 25 years. Okay, go ahead, and then Dan. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, the uh, Oslo Accords are made between Israel and the PLO, presumably. <coughs> My question is, should the PLO disappear or de is becomes declared insolvent or bankrupt? Do those accords carry any weight onto somebody else, onto the Palestinian people in general? Are there any provisions within the accords that say, should, for example, the PLO becomes redundant, then somebody else is going to be liable for those obligations that you so well uh, described for us tonight. Well, I'm not you know, perfectly clear on the legal question, but the fact of the matter is legalities have precious little to do with it. The United States and Israel are creating, as they go along, the legalities. The PLO is already bankrupt and without resources. It's simply being kept alive uh, through funds channeled by the international community through the United States and Israel. It already is a entity whose lifeline comes from the outside. And, you know, historical experience is quite, uh, quite compelling. But you can always find a stooge uh, to do the dirty work and just call it the PLO. I mean, there's, there's not much difficulty. I'm sure there are a thousand Palestinians waiting online, some even in the United States, who would like to fill that position, fill their pockets with some gold, and uh, enjoy the good life. So I don't think uh, that poses any kind of serious barrier to the plans that are now unfolding. Dan, go ahead. Thanks, Norman, for your insightful presentation, and welcome back to Ottawa. Thank you. See you again. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, about the parallels you've drawn with South Africa and uh, uh, bring them a little further, uh, in particular in relation to the ANC and its long historical, uh, uh, for many, uh, uh, historical weakness in its development from the early part of the century on through all the periods that you, uh, you outlined. And I'm wondering if you could uh, see some parallels or make some parallels with the PLO and, and uh, the questions of tactics and uh, how did the <coughs> ANC overcome its weaknesses uh, to actually become the uh, current government of, of a unified state while the Palestinians and the PLO are struggling with a Bandistan situation? Well, you know, there are different ways of trying to uh, divide up responsibility. Professor Saeed puts, I think, the onus on the PLO claiming that they bungled many opportunities. I happen not to agree with that. The fact of the matter is the Palestinians were in a almost impossible situation because they were waging the struggle against the most powerful country in the history of humanity and its local surrogate. And the likelihood of them having prevailed was in any circumstances very modest. So even if they had done everything right, uh, I don't think the prospects were bright. The fact of the matter is, history you know, is replete with examples 
the fundamental lesson of which is force works. And Israel and the United States are able to apply enough force that eventually, I guess, what was almost inevitable in the Palestinians would succumb. The one crucial difference between the Palestinian case and every other one uh, is simply that uh, in the case of Vietnam, the Palestinian, uh, South Africa, and elsewhere, the leadership never uh, gave up on its ultimate goal. Whatever detours it may have made along the way, the ultimate goal remained absolutely fixed, and it wouldn't accept any agreement short of that ultimate goal. So uh, Nelson Mandela, for example, refused to renounce the right of armed struggle until um, the South African government had agreed to one person, one vote, and democratic elections. And what happened in the case of the Palestinians is that their leadership renounced everything but got absolutely no commitments in return. Quite the contrary, as I said at the very beginning, the Accord explicitly states that Israel does not have to weigh any of its claims or positions and furthermore, that it can still claim its rights. Now, obviously, in the comparable case of South Africa, you couldn't imagine Mr. Mandela negotiating an agreement where South Africa insisted on its claim and right and position to apartheid. But that is the analogy the Palestinians conceded. I want to emphasize I am not personally putting the blame on the Palestinians. I think, in my opinion, the bulk of the responsibility is the United States and Israel. Uh, the exertion of brute force, which ultimately caused the Palestinians to succumb. As to the errors the Palestinians made, I think that's their problem. They have to clean up their house. It's not my problem. Professor Gohari. Good. Um, thank you. Three fast questions asked. Answer any or not. But, um, any non yet. <laughs> <laughs> but the, in your analysis of the um, the question that cries out for some further elaboration is why the PLO caved in. Now you quickly said collapse of the Soviet Union and the Peter of the Intifada and the debacle of the Gulf War. But what else do you add? Is it just the corruption and venality of Arafat and the PLO? Is that all that has to be said? Well, yeah. I, can I rush? Yeah. You have, does David, the name David Brooks mean anything to you? Wrote a book on water. Funded John was at IDRC or CETA? IDRC. IDRC. And I've not read the book, but he gave personally what I thought was a rather sanguine interpretation of the fairness of the water distribution. Are you familiar with David Brooks? I'm not familiar with him. I mean, some was laughable. Well, it, 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 this is involved, involves Canada and Canadian funding uh -huh. of some, uh, some persons. Are you, uh, we have a national magazine here called The Claims. Mm -hmm. Question number three. Mm -hmm. Barbara Meal uh, wrote a piece in which she was excoriating Arafat for having secretly said in Stockholm, was it, or in Oslo, that uh, this was um, to the Arab ambassadors, that this was just a preliminary tactical move and the ultimate aims have not changed one bit. Now, do you know mm -hmm. what the, the Guardian then did an analysis and said that that story was probably just really planned. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have any information about Okay, I, I want to connect the first and the third questions. You asked how do you account for uh, what Professor Said, I'm going to use his language because I just don't feel it's proper for me to be passing these kinds of judgments. So I'll just use his language. How do you account for the PLO's capitulation uh, at Oslo? Capitulation being Professor Said's word. Well, there are two basic points. One is there's an old adage if you can't beat them, join them. And I think that's, I actually think that's basically what the PLO did. And frankly, that's what most of the Palestinian intellectuals in the United States and presumably Canada as well, did as well. They realized it was a sinking ship, the Palestinian cause. They wanted their hour of glory, their hour of power and privilege, fame and fortune and so forth. So they just switched sides like typical video. Uh, academics and uh, join. Well, it's true. And join the bad wagon. And uh, of course, there was a little niche for them because Professor Saeed they wanted him off the spectrum because he was saying the wrong things, and so he wasn't 
reciting the party line, so you have to be off the spectrum. And then you have to fill it out with a Palestinian or Arab face because that's called balance. And so they got all these Palestinians eagerly waiting to fill Professor Saeed's shoes. And uh, they got their fame, their fortune, they get to go to all these conferences, go to Jerusalem and to discuss the future of Jerusalem. You know, as the ground is being taken from under them, they're sitting there talking, yakking, free trips, good time, good food, and all the rest, and you know all the rest. So, of course, uh, and as I'm telling you, there are always a thousand stooges who are ready to play that game. And I think for uh, Mr. Arafat and his uh, cronies, if you can't beat them, join them. There's also a second fact, which is exactly as in the case of the South African Bantu sense, there will be an elite who will benefit from it. There's no question about that. That you, every every arrangement, however uh, however absurd, needs some sort of social basis in order to sustain it. And there will be a handful of you know Nabil shots who are going to rake in the cash and have the good life. Uh, at the expense, expense of the Palestinians. And the third fact is, as we all know, the human capacity for self-deception is bottomless. It's probably the most, the most salient characteristic of the human consciousness. You can convince yourself of anything. And if you go back and uh, look at the Bantu stance, you'll read that, uh, well, I'll just quote, give me one half second, uh, I'll just quote to you uh, Mr. Budalazi. At the time the Bantu stands were created, he said as follows. He says, the reason I'm doing this is not because I believe in apartheid, but because I have no choice. Exactly like Arafat says, there's no choice. He says, but my real purpose is, and this goes back to what Mr. Arafat, you say, allegedly claimed in Stockholm, my real purpose is I want to create a liberated area from which I can engage in the liberation struggle on South African soil. Elsewhere he said, why am I doing this? We have created a springboard from which we can go forth to conquer in ever widening circles. We have created for our black South Africa a liberated zone, exactly what Mr. Arafat is claiming, from whence we can map our strategies and attacks on apartheid which are vital to the country as a whole. And again he says, referring to his acceptance of self-rule, it may be a contribution to the unraveling of the problem insofar as if we attain full independence, our hand will be strengthened. Well, but what to the obvious is, these are exactly the rationalizations that the Palestinian Authority and its various apologists are making. For all I know, they sincerely believe it. I'm not disputing their sincerity. As I said a moment ago, people can believe quite strange things. The point is not whether these claims or protestations are sincere. The question is, what does the historical record reveal about what came of these Bantu stands, homelands? The fact of the matter is quite clear, the record is clear. The Bantu stands did not serve as a transit point to true emancipation. What they became was a major obstacle to it because ultimately the Bantu Senate administrations joined, linked their faiths to the South African government, and when a mass movement arose in South Africa, they were on the wrong side of the barrier. Uh, assuming that you were, we have the same barrier, the same side in mind. They were on the wrong side of the barrier. And so my suggestion is, whatever the Palestinian Authority is claiming, and as I say, for all I know, these protestations are honest and sincere. They are pretty much beside the point. You can see with pretty much clarity where things are headed. They will not abet the cause. They will be an obstacle to it. I have two questions. The first one is, why do you as a Jewish person, uh, who might be considered an, an adversary, uh, do what you're doing right now? 
And the second question is, it's one thing to critique, but it's another to try and offer solutions. I'm, I'm wondering, what do you envision to be a solution to the Palestine-Israel conflict? Well, the first question I, I kind of like to avoid because I, I think it's sort of like uh, there's a kind of self-aggrandizement, an element.